Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Okay, why don't you open your Bible with me and go into uh, Revelation chapter 19. And I want to carry on. Who is Jesus? That's what we're looking at. Who is Jesus? And uh, we're looking in the book of Revelation. And uh, <clears throat> of course, the Bible abounds in, uh, in insights to who Jesus is. In John 5, Jesus said to the, to, the, to the Pharisees, he said, you search through scriptures and you think that in them you find life. He said, you go right through the Bible looking to find life. He said, they all talk about me and you won't come to me that you might have life. So the Bible is full of the revelation of Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus is there. And you say, well, I didn't see Jesus in the Old Testament. Well, listen to the book of Genesis. He's the father of faith. He's the promised son. In the book of Genesis, he's the deliverer that delivers the nation. He's the, also the lamb that sheds his blood. Uh, you go through each book. In Exodus, he's the, the, he's the, uh, the one who uh, brings the nation out. He's the rock that provides the water. He is the brass serpent that hang on the cross so that people could be healed. When you go into Leviticus, he's the high priest. He's also the offering. Every book of the Bible, Jesus appears. In Joshua, he is the triumphant warrior king who possesses the land and conquers the enemies and makes a provision for God's people. In 1 Samuel, he's the prophet whose words never fall to the ground. In 1, uh, 1 Kings, he becomes the king, the shepherd king who saves and builds a nation. In the uh, book of 2 Kings, he becomes the wise man who builds the temple. And then we go through, he, in every He's the one who restores the temple. Nehemiah, he rebuilds the walls. So Jesus is found right through the Bible. You've just got to look for him in the Bible. That's why Jesus said, you search the word and you're, and you're looking for life in the words. They speak of me. You've got to come to me. That's where life is found. It's in the relationship, the flow of a dynamic relationship, not just in lots of laws and principles. And so we could go right through the Bible. How many? It's interesting, isn't it? You know, he's the shepherd. He's the one who purchased the prostitute and then redeemed her. He's everywhere in the Bible. The Bible is about Jesus. It is the revelation. So we get to the book of Revelation, and now it's the revelation, as, as, uh, as Elam was saying, of Jesus Christ. And certain things are revealed. Uh, firstly, of course, it's revealed what he is to the churches. But I want to follow and go through to the last part of Revelation. And this has yet to unfold. And we saw there are three aspects of this. One, he is the bridegroom who loves us. Now, remember, these are just pictures of Jesus to help you know what it's like and then show you how to relate. So as the bridegroom, we saw he loves us. A passionate love. He wants to come and save us. Uh, he pursues us. Uh, he wants to forgive us. He wants to enter into covenant with us. And so we see him as the one who offers a covenant love, a, a lifelong, rela eternal relationship. What a wonderful thing. Our role is to submit, receive him and enter that relationship and live like someone married to the king. Then now we want to look today at him being the king. Well, that's an awesome one, isn't it? Revelations 19, verse 11. And he said, Now I saw heaven opened, and I saw a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness judges and makes war. Sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. The armies of heaven clothed in white linen uh, and the white and clean followed him on white horses also. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So now we see he's revealed uh, not just as someone who loves you intentionally and forgives you and will pick you up and care for you and nurture you, that, that gentle, loving side of him. Now we see another facet of him. It is the same person, but here's another facet of him. He is a sovereign or powerful king. Now, most people like to relate to Jesus as the one who died on the cross for their sins and loves them and is always going to be there. We love the words of comfort, but we need to grow up and understand he is a king. And uh, essentially around that, I'll come into opening this passage in a minute. I want to just lay several things out about Jesus being king. Firstly, he is king over a kingdom, not a democracy. 
It's not about my ideas and what I think. And I think this and I think that. Jesus is king over a kingdom, a realm of rule. And the only place in all creation that is rebelling against that rule is this planet we're on. The contention globally is about who will rule. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. He said, well, I don't see it. <laughs> that doesn't mean he doesn't have it. You don't see the air either. It doesn't mean it's not there. What we haven't seen is the exercise of that authority in a global scale. We've seen it in a local scale, but not in a global scale. So Jesus came as the servant king, but now he will come as the conquering king. So the Jesus you read about that came the first time, don't think he's coming that way the second time. That's not true. It's not how the Bible reveals him. Second thing about him uh, being a king is he has an, he's established a government. There's a government in the heavens, and he's delegated government to angels. He's delegated government in the heavens and in the earth. So every time you engage, every time you encounter an authority in the earth, you are encountering the government of God. You say, well, I don't like some of them. They're not nice. That's irrelevant. The core issue is your heart attitude to authorities wherever you are in life. If you understand he's the king of a kingdom and you're in the kingdom, Romans 13 says, submit yourselves to those in authority because God has ordained or put them in these places. So therefore, every time you meet a person in authority, whether they act well, act badly, whether they do their job well or don't do their job badly, you are encountering the authority of God. Keep respect for that delegated authority because you are respecting God. Think about that. Get any idea? Okay then. The third thing about it is that in his kingdom, Jesus has established protocols which are ways of doing things and order. In other words, Jesus' kingdom is incredibly ordered. The planet is quite ordered. It runs by laws and rules and principles which God set in place. But his kingdom, both invisible and visible, also has order and protocols. There are ways of doing things in a kingdom. You know, if you want to go visit the king, there are ways or protocols of accessing the king. And so it's the same in the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, the Bible tells us, for example, in Acts 4, 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That is a protocol. That's a way. There is no other way to get saved but through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I know we would like to be tolerant of everyone and everything and all the other things in the world, but there is no other way a man can be saved except through Jesus Christ. God has set his protocols in place. He set his order in place. Here's the protocol for salvation. Acknowledge Jesus Christ. There is no other way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So God has set things in place. And not only that, uh, we, he has set the way you can access God. There's a certain way to access the presence of God. If you don't follow God's way, you don't enjoy the access to his kingdom benefits and privileges. Uh, associated with that, there is a way of ordering our relationships. The husband is the head of the wife. Now, you may not understand what it means and how to outwork it, but it's an order God set in place that the spirit world operates under. God has set things in order. He set principles in place for us to govern our life. Principles for your finances. Now the problem is we get saved in a democracy. We come into a kingdom and then don't understand there's a major reformation needed in our thinking to change our lifestyle to live as a kingdom person. And there's a reason for that as we'll see shortly. Here's a, another thing too about this kingdom is that Jesus has absolute standards in his kingdom. Now, the, the liberals and humanists don't like these absolute standards, but the kingdom of heaven has absolute standards. Lie, truth, holiness, uncleanness. There's absolute standards in his kingdom. And this is, the, this is the, 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 the issue that humanism has brought, is to dilute down absolutes until you're wishy-washy, and it's, well, I feel this, and I think that, and in this circumstance, this, and that circumstance, that, uh, all this whole area of humanistic thinking. There are absolute standards. For example, God makes it very clear. If you just read, here's, a, here's an interesting example. If I just read in 1 Corinthians, uh, in chapter 6, I'll just read a little bit of a verse. Look at this. And he says, 
verse 9. Do you not know the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom? Huh? Be not deceived. In other words, don't get this one wrong. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, none of them will inherit the kingdom. It's simple. If you're doing those things, you won't inherit things in the kingdom. It's as simple as that. In other words, God has some clear absolutes that we don't negotiate over to suit ourselves. They're non-negotiables in the kingdom. And finally, here's the last one. You'll love this. He has the power to call all men and all nations to account for what they did. He has got the power. Just because you haven't seen him exercise it doesn't mean he doesn't have it. He has as sovereign king the right and the power to call every person, every government, every nation to account, and he will do it. That's an interesting thing. In Revelation 20 verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and all were judged, small and great. President of the United States, Queen of England, no matter who you are, everyone gives account. So that is the nature of a king in his kingdom. Now, let's go and have a look here and see how Jesus is revealed in Revelation 19. And I want to give you some simple ways that you can just respond to this revelation. Get an idea? Revelation 19. Okay, first of all, I saw heaven open. So uh, John is getting a vision. He's getting revelation from heaven about something that has not yet happened. And he said, I saw a white horse and someone sitting on him. So the first thing you see is his transport. Now, don't look and think of horses. Think back there, if someone was on a white horse, they were a military commander and they were on their way to a battle. So probably if we were to put it in today's language, we'd say, I saw an F-15, it was armed to the teeth, and he was sitting there driving it. That's probably more the language that we would have. And uh, so uh, the first thing you see is the, the white horse is a military picture of a conquering king. So when Jesus returns, he will return as a, uh, as a triumphant king to conquer the world, to subdue the world. That's got to be good news, isn't it? He's coming to subdue it. Notice the second thing it does about his character. He is faithful and true and righteous. In other words, he's faithful. He fulfills what he says he'll do. Not only that, he is true to his word. He's true to his character. He never, ever goes outside what he says he'll do. He's true. And his righteousness, the decisions he makes, are right. Now, you think about why is Jesus going to do all these things. They're very, very simple. You see it in a moment. Another thing about his eyes, his eyes are a flaming fire. Now, of course, you look at it, you've got to think about this spiritually. When you see someone whose eyes are blazing, what do you know is going on inside them? There is passion. Have you seen an angry person? Whoa! You, whoa! They raise flaring. Of course, they've probably got devils flaring out their eyes, but he's got something else inside. He's got this passionate, zealous love for his people, and he's about to enter and do something to make the world a different place with them and through them and for them. He, so when his eyes are ablaze, it's because there's passion inside. You ever seen a person who's lost all their fire in life? Their eyes are dull. And what it's really saying is, he is full of life and passion. It flows out of a heart that's ignited with love and fire and holiness. And that's something else, eh? That glory, that's what he's like. And not only that, they see right through you into where you are and every little thing going on inside you. Can't hide. Yes, you get one look from Jesus and you're undone. It's like he took off all your clothes and there you are and everything is there. You can see everything. You cannot hide from his gaze. His eyes go right through to the core of your soul. Today we all dress up and look pretty, but before Jesus, he looks straight through to who we are. Second, next thing you notice is his head. On his head are many crowns. Word crown is that of a victor, someone who's fought a battle and triumphed. And on his head are many crowns. What you've got to realize is that is a picture that he has fought many, many battles, and in every one he has triumphed and won the victory. You want to follow someone? Follow someone who won, not someone who lost. He's won the victory, and he's won the victory in battles. He's skillful at war and winning battles. You've got a financial battle, he's won that. You've got a marriage battle, he knows how to handle that. He's having them all the time with his bride. Think about that. Come on. 
He's having them all the time. He got a, a battle with people. He had many of them. He knows how to conquer battles with people. He got people rejecting you. Oh, he knows how to conquer that battle too. You're feeling depressed and down and rejected. Oh, oh he knows how to deal with that. You had some devil sitting on you like a monkey clawing into your ears. He knows how to conquer that one. I would want to follow someone who's won the battles. And so he's betrayed. Oh, oh many crowns. Hallelujah. And that's why it says... When you come before him, here's the protocol of heaven. When you come into his presence, you know what you do? You take your crowns and throw them at his feet. In other words, acknowledge you got the victory and he gets the honor. See, the, the, the picture language is to help us engage with heaven, engage with God. So this is this wonderful king. Man, oh man. And his clothes, and notice this, his names. No one knew his name except him. You think, well, what does that mean? I know his name. His name's Jesus. No, no, no. Listen, what it's mean, when it says no man knew his name, this is what it's meaning. The name speaks of the nature, what a person is like. So when it says no man knew his name, this is what it's saying. There are things about Jesus you can't even find in the Bible. Only he knows them and he's going to make them known in the end times. You will be surprised. He is unsearchable. There's so much to be known about him. Not only that, he is also known as the Word of God because everything he does is in harmony with the Word of God. He never departs from the Word of God. That's why it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. His love shows what it means to live out the written Word of God. His name is the Word of God. What else is he called? The King of Kings. He's the sovereign ruler over everyone. You met a king, he's a king over them. You think someone's important? He's over them. You think someone's got some power? He's over them and more powerful. He's the king of kings and like to repeat it, the Lord of lords. So he's over the whole deal. You've got to understand this is the one that we are working with. This is the one we are connected. This is the one who loves us. It says here about his armies. Oh, look at his armies. Armies, more than one. There's an army in heaven, angelic army. There's an army on earth. Saints of the living God, his armies. Oh, I love that. And his armies. Let's see if I can find it. I'm getting excited here. The armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So it tells how they're clothed. It says, first of all, they're in heaven. In other words, they have learned these are people who are mobilized to flow together for a military purpose of conquest to advance a kingdom in the earth. They are in heaven. That means that they are connected by the Holy Ghost. You are already connected to heaven. And all you have to do is learn how to enter and stay in that realm of the Spirit. And you are part of the army of God in heaven following this conquering king who wants to advance his kingdom through the world. It's an absolutely amazing picture. And they're clothed in fine linen, which the Bible tells us is the righteous acts. It is the, the right doing of the saints. White speaks of the glory of God, the life and nature of God. Clean and white, white and clean. Clean means purity. So now we see very clearly that Jesus is not just coming alone. He's coming and he has mobilized people with a certain purpose. And this is what the purpose is. Take over the earth. Take over the earth. We're not to get out of it and abandon it. We're to transform it. But at this stage, we're transforming it by the proclaiming of the gospel. When he comes, it'll be with the raw power of God as well as the gospel. And oh my, when the raw power of God comes, you want to read your Bible and find out what happens to people who stand in the way. Not good. You know, the God of the Old Testament is still our God. And when people stood in his way, there's some horrible things happen. Angel Lord came on one army and couple of hundred thousand died overnight. Came on another couple of guys and fire came from heaven on them. You see, God is not limited in his power. Just because he doesn't use it doesn't mean he doesn't have it. And it doesn't mean he won't hold back forever. This is exciting. You don't have to look at the world and say, oh, it's so bad, it's getting worse. Oh my, read the book of Revelation. Who we are following and what he is like and what he will do. Look at what it says. It says his clothes, his robe. His robe was dipped in blood. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Now, it, I, I'm not too sure. It didn't say whether it's his blood or not. So probably it's like this. If you 
if you are, I guess every, you're writing there to a, a group of people who were used to military combat where soldiers carried shields and swords and they got into face-to-face -face close quarter combat. Now, if you ever see someone come back from that kind of battle, they are covered in blood, someone else's blood. So I, to me, it just seems to speak uh, uh, very, very clearly that uh, he engages at close quarters. He's not going to do this from distant he will engage in close quarters in addressing issues in the earth. He will be engaged personally. He'll also be engaged through his body. Here's the next thing it says. Uh, what, what else it do? It, it tells something else about his, uh, his, uh, his actions. What does he do? Here's three things that he does. Number one, he judges and makes war. And he says, it doesn't sound like the Jesus we knew. You're right, but it's still him. He came as a servant king and everyone missed him. Why? Because they're looking for a king who'd come and take over and conquer Rome. Right till the very end, the disciples thought he was going to come and set up an army and conquer, conquer the earth. And they got it wrong that time. Why did they think that? Because the Bible tells us he will do that. It's just not that time, but next time. Next time. Next time. I have to look and be in panic about, oh, you know, the, the, the Muslims are spreading through the world and this is happening. Don't live in fear. Oh, what's happening? You read the news. Quick, get the latest concern about what's happening in the world. Listen, get into the Bible and see what it says and align with heaven and the purpose of heaven. That's a much better plan, I would think. So he judges and makes war. That means he intervenes to put things right. Now, why is he doing this? Because he is a passionate lover of people and he will not stand back forever and allow evil to triumph. He will finally come in and say, I'm putting an end to this now. He will judge it. That is evil and wrong. Repent now or you're finished. He'll make war. War means a conflict between two governments as who will rule and be in charge. So he will judge. He'll look out of love, out of righteousness, and see what is right and what is wrong, and he'll sort out those things by confronting them. He says, you'll strike the nations. Now, that's interesting. I, I can't develop all of these, but here's an interesting thought. The nations, that's all the nations. So whatever he's going to do will affect all the nations. There will be confrontation over government over the nations. It says in one place all the kings will be gathered together to battle and they'll all be wiped out in one day. God is going to shift governance in every nation of the earth. Every nation of the earth will experience change in governance. Right government. He will root out corruption. He will root out injustice. He will root out the things that are going on that grieve any good person. He will root them out. And he'll replace people who won't repent with those who will fulfill his will and rule righteously. He will have a righteous government. And you say, well, I, I find that hard to believe. Listen, there was a day in David's day when there was a righteous government in the earth, in a nation. And it was there to let all the world know how good it is when there's godly government, how blessed a nation is. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a shame for any people. Laws like this are a shame on our nation. And also a huge problem for us. Don't make no, no, no mistake. You will find once that law, if it's passed, it will increase demonic activity of a perverse nature in the nation because it will be legally allowed by the representatives on earth. That's a perversion. Okay, well, we'll carry on, move on. We need to get some hope in here. Notice the last thing it says that I picked up there is, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword to strike the nations. Oh, so it's not like he's got a sword in his mouth, he's got a long tongue or anything like that. Listen, this is the word of God. Very sharp, very powerful, very quick. And when God speaks, something happened. Jesus spoke to the tree, no more fruit, and it withers and dies. Jesus spoke to the storm, silent. It was silent. That's the sharp sword. That's what it means to say sharp sword. It means the word he speaks is spirit and life and is empowered by heaven and it always does not return to avoid. It does what it's called to do. So if he's going to smite nations, he's going to speak prophetically into nations and consequences will come. Now you think, well, I don't know. I don't know whether I can go along with that. It seems all a bit much. Okay, read a Jeremiah. Read Jeremiah and then go to the history and ask where are all the nations he prophesied against and what kind of end did they come to? Where are they now? They are exactly where he prophesied. 
You see, these things are all through the Bible. The Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Its whole center is on Jesus Christ. Okay, so how can I respond to all this? What should I do? Isn't this exciting getting some things out of the Word like this? But what can I do? What do I do? What do I do? You know, I need to know what to do, not just get excited about the Word. Number one, I need to acknowledge Jesus' right to rule. Bottom line is, at a personal level, if you are here today and you are not a Christian, you've not given your life to Christ, you're living your life your own way, you're a rebel against heaven, you're a rebel against the order of God, you're a rebel against God's government, your life is out of order and you are suffering immensely. Not only are you not in the kingdom of heaven, you are under the rule of another kingdom, a demonic kingdom called the kingdom of darkness. It rules your life and torments you and seeks to steal from you continually. The first thing is to acknowledge I have run my life my own way. Jesus, I come to you as the one who loves me and I submit to your right to rule my life. I acknowledge you as Lord. Notice what it says in Romans 10, 9. If we believe in our heart and confess Jesus Christ is Lord or King, then we'll be saved. This is an issue of governance. Living in one kingdom, coming into another kingdom and reordering my whole life. It's not just when I come to church, that's the end of it. Nothing like that at all. Second thing, what do I need to do? Well, because I'm called into his kingdom, I now need to learn how to live in his kingdom. I need someone to help me and empower me to do it. I need to receive the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, which is an entrance into a spirit world. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come on you. I need to get filled with the Spirit because I can't live in the Spirit dimension with God. I can't live a kingdom life without the power to live that life. And that power is given to me. He's the Holy Ghost. He's a glorious person. Hallelujah. Maybe some of you at that point now. Here's the third thing I need to consider. I need to consider aligning my life into God's order. Aligning my relationships with God's order. Now you start to think about it. It starts with your personal heart. Jesus said in John 14 verse 21, He that has my commandments and keeps them, He's the one that loves me, and my Father and I will come and manifest ourselves. You're not getting much of God. Perhaps you have commandments of God you're ignoring. Now notice what Jesus said. If you keep my commandments, that's how you demonstrate you really love me. This is not a legal thing. This is what this is. This is what this is. I looked and I thought, oh man, that's a tough statement. If you keep my commandments, then you love me. And I think if you do what I tell you, then you love me. It sounds incredibly hard, doesn't it? But it's not meant to be like that. In fact, that's actually not what it's about. What he's saying is something like this. All your life, you thought that doing it your way, you would have your needs met. And it's not worked. So I want you to repent And recognize that the ways you've tried to run your life and manage your life and control your life do not work at all. There is a need to turn from them and in faith believe that aligning with me will get what you are looking for. See? And so what I need to do, if there's a mess in my life, the first question you ask is where do I need to align up with God and His ways? Repentance and faith is the foundation for living in kingdom life. You say, well, I repented years ago. Ooh, I think you should repent before you go home. Listen, repentance is the continued process of recognizing when I'm living out of my own strength, my own way, my own ability, my own ideas about life, and coming to realize it's not working, and it never was going to work, and recentering, letting rid of the idols, and recentering on the king and his kingdom, letting my life be aligned with God. Your finances. It's the most vulnerable place. Everyone, finances, money. And you think, whoa, don't talk to me about money. No, because you want to stay not aligned with heaven. But God wants to talk about your money. Why? Because he wants to bless you. He wants you to be aligned with heaven so he can increase blessing in your life and the flow of blessing that comes through divine alignment. This is true of every area of life. This is what God is saying to the churches at this time. All right, and then here's the last one. I'd love to develop this more, but I don't have the time. So I'm just going to put it out to you. Here's the, here's the last couple of things. We need to learn how to enter and experience kingdom realities. I need to learn how to enter and experience 
kingdom realities. What, what do we mean by that? I'll give you a few things now. I need to learn, for example, in Hebrews 4 verse 15 says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and grace to help. So I need to learn how to, in my personal prayer life, come near to God. I have to learn that it's by faith that just in a moment of time I can just access and step into His presence immediately and feel Him and engage Him. So I need to learn how to do that. It's done by faith. It's done by boldly coming into His presence and believing I'm forgiven. It's done through repentance. It's done through praise and worship. There's a number of protocols the Bible says how to enter His presence. Let me tell you this. It is normal for every believer to enjoy access to heaven's presence, the presence of God and the reality of His kingdom. It's a normal thing. If it's not happening, there's something you need to learn to do and something you need to align up in your life in terms of priorities. But that would be normal. Here's, in, in relationship, I need to learn how to enter the presence of my God and how to present myself. Do you know how to present yourself to Him? That day by day, we're called to present ourselves. There's various parts of you to present to Him. Have you thought about that? And have you thought about when you stand in the presence of a king, how you stand? See, that's what the Bible teaches us about, how to stand in the presence of the king of kings because he is the king of kings. He's calling us to be a king or to rule or have authority in our own area of life. Here's another thing to think about. Uh, he's called us to see and hear. Why? Because that's how Jesus lived his life. So it's normal for us as part of this kingdom is to learn how to see in the Spirit and hear in the Spirit. We have courses to help you with that. Here's another thing that would be normal to learn to do, how to receive from God, how to step into His presence and begin to imbibe His peace because the kingdom of heaven is peace. How to imbibe His joy and to begin to feel it and draw it around your life. That would be something all of us are called to do because we're in a kingdom now and we have access. Here's another thing you could learn to do, and that is as you've come into the presence of the king and worshipped him and loved on him and done these things, then he wants to teach you how to arise as a king representing him and speak over your situation, speak over your life, speak over your relationships, make decrees of the word of God that heaven will back up. To bring your life and those things around you so that God's able to manifest in them. This is exciting, the kingdom side of Jesus. Finally, we're called to share and advance that kingdom with others. To win people to Christ. Go make disciples of all nations. Well, there's got to be something for everyone in that lot. There would have to be something for everyone in that lot. I will just want you to close your eyes for a moment. And just think and let the Holy Spirit challenge you. And I want to just quickly ask you, in what area God spoke to you? It helps, instead of saying, boy, that was enthusiastic. Now let's get over to Art Deco and out there in the afternoon. Before you do that, just make a decision what God said and how you'll respond. So close your eyes right now. Just This will only take about three minutes to do this, but this is the important part for you. I can feel His presence just so strong right now. Hard to stand up, actually. It is. I'm really finding it hard to stand because I can feel His presence so strong right now. Here's the first question. Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you come into His kingdom? Have you come to the one who loves you and desires to lead you, who's demonstrated His love by dying on the cross for you? Have you come to Him? He wants to lead you to show Himself as the lover of your soul and the one who will lead and govern your life and make you blessed and prosperous, fulfill your destiny. Is there any person here today right, right at that point where you want to receive Jesus? I'd love you just to raise your hand and let me know. Any person here ready to receive Jesus, become a Christian today? Why don't you just raise your hand and possibly even come back to Him because you walked away from Him. Is there anyone? God bless. I see your hand over there. Anyone else? God bless. See your hand over there. Anyone else? Come to Jesus today. Best decision you could make today. Is there anyone else? Here's the second question. Have you received the Holy Ghost and got filled with the Spirit yet? 
be a great step for you to take. Is there anyone here who needs to be filled with the Spirit? Here's the third thing. We need to align our life with God's Word. Is there some area that you know you're fighting God, you've got out of order, and maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's some character area, it's a sin issue in your life, and say, God, I need to repent today. Just raise your hand and say, that's me. God's speaking to me about an area to put right. Maybe it's a relationship you need to put right. God bless, God bless. What about entering the presence of God and living in kingdom life? How many of you felt the challenge today to learn how to enter in God's presence more consistently day by day? How many felt that? God bless, many hands. How many felt you needed to learn how to present yourself to God, each part of your life to Him? How many felt that today? Quite a number, very good. How many felt the challenge, I need to learn how to see and hear what God is saying and doing? How many felt that? How oh, many today? How many felt God speaking to you need to learn to stand up and speak and decree His Word and start to exercise spiritual authority? God bless. How many of you felt God speak to you? You needed to be more proactive in advancing the kingdom of God by sharing your faith with others. God bless so many. Father, I thank you today that you are speaking to our hearts. We feel your sovereign presence right now. Just as we finish, there are two people put their hand up to come to Jesus. Could you please make your way to the front and stand in front of me? I'd love to just pray with you right now. Take about a minute or two, that's it. There were two hands went up, one over here, I think, and one over there. Would you like to just come? There's a woman over here, put a hand up to come back to Jesus or come to the Lord. Anyone else? There are two people. God bless you, dear. Is there anyone else? If you didn't put your hand up, you can still come. God bless. God bless. Are there others? Is there anyone else today? God bless. Clap. Hey, God bless you. Awesome. Just turn around, stand over here, face me. That's right. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you, dear. So good to see you. I'm so glad you came up. What's your name? Jolene and Sky. God bless. Is there anyone else who wants to join Jolene and Sky today as they make a prayer and give their hearts to Jesus? Anyone else? Please come. Please come. Please come. Right now. Make, just step up, walk up, and stand here. This will change your life. Anyone else? Bido Church, I want you to help me. Just close our eyes. We're going to pray a simple prayer. To, we're going to talk to Jesus. When we pray, He will hear and He will respond. So I want you all to just help these ones at the front, Jolene and Skies, as we come and we pray together and open our heart to Jesus. You ready? Listen to me and follow me in this prayer. Make it your prayer. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Lord, I've lived my life without you, doing it my own way. Today I turn to you. Jesus, I ask you to forgive all of my sins, to make me clean inside. I receive your spirit into my heart. I receive you as my Savior and Lord. And I give you my life today. Before heaven and earth I declare. Jesus Christ is my Savior and King. Amen. Lord, I just thank you. Lord, I just pray for Sky right now. Let your loving presence just touch her now, Lord. Let the love of God just flow over her heart and life. Lord, bring peace to the turmoil she's gone through. I, I just see your life in tremendous turmoil. I feel the Lord showing me there's been this huge injustice and it's really, really had a deep impact in your life and you've been struggling. God wants you to know He cares about you and what you've been facing. He understands the lies that were spoken about you and how it's hurt you, how it's affected your relationships and your friendships. God's wanting you to know He will not leave you nor turn from you. He will help you. The Lord wants you to let go, not struggle as you've struggled to prove you're right. Put it in the Lord's hands. He will work the situation out for you. He will help you. While you struggle in your own strength, there's been so much hurt and frustration, and the pain has come to such a level, you're saying, God, I don't know what I can go on anymore. God says, put it in my hands. Let me work it my way and see what I'm able to do. Touch your Lord right now with your mighty power. In Jesus' name. 
Thank you, Lord. She just fell over because the power of God touched her. Did you feel God touching her and she was weeping? Can I pray for you too? Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just thank you right now for Jolene. Lord, you know her, you love her, you, you understand her life and her challenges. Here's what I feel the Lord putting on my heart. There God's saying, He will never leave you nor abandon you as other people have. I see from when you're very young, I see people abandoning you and the struggle you've had with loneliness. And God wants you to know He is your friend. He was with you in all of those difficulties. He was with you as people turned their back on you and spoke against you. And He wants you to know He will not do those things to you. He is your friend. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never turn away from you. I'll never abandon you as people have abandoned you. But I'm kind and loving, and it's not my nature to abandon you, says the Lord. Lord, today come upon her, let your love flow into her heart. You're carrying such grief. Today, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I break the spirit of grief and rejection right now. Let it go, in Jesus' mighty name. There it is, okay. Let God touch you now. He loves you, dear. He loves you. He loves you.